Young women have been growing up with an indoctrination of what womanhood is and what it should be. They've been taught everything that is in direct opposition to the Word of God. Young women who want to be different from the world are rare, but they are real. On this Rare But Real podcast, Audrey Brogy will often be joined by her daughter, Grace Anna, and her daughters-in-law, Maureen, Kesset, and Marilyn, who desire to be discerning in a day when everything seems to go against God's design. Join them in the journey of becoming rare but real. It takes courage and conviction. And now, Audrey Brogy. Okay, this session is called God's Heart for Discipline. And I want to say before I start with this, now my two of my granddaughters have joined us, and they've been here this weekend. They're over there sitting with their mom. And, um, and they, they, wanted, they were with Carl last night, um, and they watched the conference together last night. They wanted to hang out with their granddaddy, which I have to tell you meant everything to him. So, um, so I'm, but I'm glad they're here today. So anyway, I just wanted to say that before I started. God's heart for discipline. Okay, I'm going to talk, begin by talking about the importance of God's word in your heart. That's like, you've probably already picked up on this, but that's like an overriding theme. It's, I just weave it in all the time because of how important it is. And let me give you some passages that I believe are critical, that they're passages. I always say that every mother should learn and memorize and know like she knows her street address. (laughs) Love the Lord your God. This is in Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 to 7. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Don't you love that? Because he's just saying, as you go about life, you should be talking talking about the things of the Lord. And one of the jobs of parents is to impress the things of the Lord on their children's hearts. But he also says it must be on your heart first because that's what's going to spill over to your children. And then in Isaiah, the scripture says, but the word of the Lord, it was to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. He's just, the, 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 the meaning of that is like, it's just as you go, little bit by little bit. Now, in the context of that, some people were making fun, but that's not the, that's not the point of what I want to share with you. The, sh- the point of that is to remember that sometimes people say, well, you know, I've been sharing the gospel with my child, but they don't seem to get it. I always say it's precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. As you go, they're not sometimes going to get it the first time. I mean, a two-year-old's not going to understand the gospel, but you're getting it into them. There's so much, it's just as you go, and little by little, God opens their eyes and sh- shows them things. I mean, there's times in so many children's lives as they grow up, they can't even remember, they cannot remember a time when they didn't know about the Lord. Now, there was actually a point in time that God saved them. But even for me, I can't remember exactly when I got saved. I know I got saved because I knew what I understood, but it was over the course of time. My parents always uh, giving me the truth of God's word and it's, it related to the gospel. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, now I'm just going to read a little bit of it, but that whole chapter you should memorize. Seriously, and if you want to hear more in-depth teaching on that, I taught 1 Corinthians 13 in four sessions. It's called The Greatest Love, and if you go to the Search the Scriptures app, if you put that on your smartphone, and then when you, you download that, and then you go, and there's a place on there at the bottom that says, Woman's Life, and you click on that, and you'll see a lot of the things that I've taught in depth, things that I've mentioned on the surface here, but in depth, and that's for, if you really want to understand 1 Corinthians 13, listen to that and let it help you in your understanding of the scripture. But he says, if I speak with the tongue of men, tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And so many of us, as we're raising our families, that's what we've become, just noisy gongs and clanging cymbals. You know, and then the, the passage continues and says, love is patient, love's kind, love bears all things. And I love that it says it's kind because that's one of the, that's the list in Titus chapter uh, two of what older women are to teach the younger women to be kind. And kind comes right after to be workers at home. Because think of how much when you're a worker at home and your kids drive you crazy about whatever it is, then you're not kind. 
And God wants you to learn to be kind even in your firmness and sternness and bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. God is always kind even when he disciplines us. And love bears all things, it endures all things, and it never fails. Memorize the chapter. And then Ephesians 5, I've already uh, mentioned this passage. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. That means excess. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And I already walked through Colossians chapter 3. It's the sister passage to Ephesians chapter 5, but that's another one. You should know. You should memorize. These passages should be like, I mean, this is a good starting place for you to know God's Word because they're such practical passages for you to know and to know the results when I let the word of Christ richly dwell within me. If, it, if, if I'm not living out some of these things, then I know I'm not letting it richly dwell within me. And then Ephesians 6, 4 says, and fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And then Proverbs 29, 17 says, discipline your son and he will give you peace. He will bring delight to your soul. And and by way of reminder, those of you who know me and know Pastor Carl, you know we've always encouraged people to read Proverbs every day. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. So... Our longer months are 31 days on when, when February rolls around and when the months that have 30 days roll around, you just go ahead and read to the end of the book and then start back over on Proverbs 1. Do, train your children in that. And what you'll learn, if you do that every day, again, you're going to learn so much wisdom for life, you won't even realize how much you know how to make decisions, how God will use that in your life, because that's what it is. It's a book filled with wisdom for practical, everyday living. And even the things that God will bring to your mind as you're reading with your children, you know, I mean, some of it's like incredibly funny, you know, how the sluggard is so lazy, he won't even bring his hand up from the dish, you know, and you can act that out if you have a bent in the dramatic. You can do those things. Or like, oh, the sluggard, he's so lazy. He says, there's a lion in the street. I might be slain. I mean, he's just making that up. He's like, you know, he's looking for excuses not to work. Oh, I might, you know, there's a lion out there. He might eat me up. You know, I mean, you teach your children so much about life. That, so you know what, guys, we're not going to be lazy today. Get up there and get those chores done and report back here at nine o'clock because we're starting with math or whatever it is. <laughs> um, and then, of course, Psalm 34. It's another one to memorize. I taught that. I taught Psalms this past year at Woman's Life. Memorize that one. Um, then the importance of, say, okay, so that's the importance of God's Word in your life. Now it's the importance, importance of a mother's walk with the Lord. You take, taking the Scripture and applying it to your life. Now, for example, I'll sh- share another story about... Um, my two older boys, when they were little boys and we were living in Texas and I had this little Fisher Price table and sometimes they like to eat lunch at that table. And I, and it was by the curtains next to, you know, the big table, but it was just right there. Anyway, and Grace Anna was a baby, so she was in the high chair. But they like to eat across from each other and talk about like random things. And so I, often their lunch was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and raisins. And that's what they were eating that day. So they had the bright idea that they were going to see who would be better at throwing the raisins across the table and getting it in their brother's mouth. So they were doing that. And I said, guys, don't do that. I said, just don't do that. Very calmly, very nice. And they said, okay, we won't. But you know what? They didn't listen to me. They did it again. I said, guys, I said, don't do that. And they didn't listen to me. And they kept doing it. And then, I, and then on the, I don't know if it was the third, fourth, whatever time it was, but then they got so rowdy that the, they yanked the curtain down. Now, I didn't have the best curtains, but still, the curtain came tumbling down, and then I was mad. But I remember in that moment, because I just wanted to go jerk them up and spank them. And I don't mean abuse them, I just mean spank them. 
But I, uh, but I, was re- I had been reasoning with them. And at one point during that whole little scenario, I had gone over to the table and gotten on my knees and said, now, boys, I don't want you to do this because blah, blah, blah. I guess I was being a gentle parent. But, but they weren't listening. And I walked into the other room. And again, I'm a young mom. I just walked into the other room and I said, Lord, I know I shouldn't spank them in anger. And it was just then that the Lord brought to my mind, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child and the rod of correction draws it far from them. And I remember thinking, I don't know, just at that moment, I thought I should have spanked them as soon as they disobeyed me because it was foolish for them to disobey their mother. And when you do it, then you're not mad. You're doing it because it's right. You're doing it because that's what they need. And again, I'm talking about biblical spanking, which we'll talk about. I'm not talking about, I know our world doesn't like to talk about spanking. But it was a moment for me. God used that. You know, James 1 says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you can encounter various trials. Sometimes our trials come in the forms of, of these issues of trying to bring our children under control. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, I mean, y'all think about this first. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Remember, you don't have because you don't ask, James tells us. And it says, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously. That's who God is. He lavishes his grace upon us. He's generous in his giving. And he says he gives generously and without reproach, and it will be giving to him. I didn't verbalize it like this. I lack wisdom. But I said, Lord, I need your help. And, and, you know, it wasn't the evil one who brought scripture to my mind in that particular moment. It was the Lord. Like, my word is true. God's word is true. So here's, so we'll keep going. Some steps for mom's heart. Matthew 15, 18. I haven't given you the uh, scripture reference for this when I've referred to it, but but here it is. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those defile the man. Now, I want you to understand, and I I think I said it before, I'm not sure, but that we all have the capacity to be horrible women and horrible moms. And the reason we have that capacity is because we are sinners, because of our sin nature. The only reason that even unbelievers can be good moms is because of the grace of God and his generosity. Remember, he gives, he does give a natural love to all, but we need to be taught how to love God's way as we learned in the last session. Rather than always focusing on your children's behavior, here's a good reminder, Focus on yours. Sometimes think about yourself in that regard, in terms of your own sin and how you're reacting to things. And understand that there's no one who can meet your deepest needs except God. Sometimes you're responding in a bad way to your children because you've got something going on in your own life. Or you're like mad at your husband because you think he's supposed to meet every single need that you have, even the ones that you haven't expressed. What's wrong? Nothing. He doesn't even know what's wrong with you. But you're like, expect him to know you want him to be God. And he can't be God. He can't. Neither can you. But they can't. Your husband can't meet your deepest needs. Your children can't meet your deepest needs. Your friends, your circumstances. And I already told you last night that an unhappy woman is not made happy by a change in any of these things. Y'all, it's so important for us to understand this. God tells us in his word that he is to be our source of joy. He wants to be our source of joy. John 14, verses 9 to 11, just as the Father has loved me... I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Is your joy made full? Do you experience the joy of the Lord? I mean, he tells us here, he loves you. And he wants you to abide in his love. He wants you to set your mind on the things above. And then he wants you to obey him. So often, I mean, here's the thing. Obedience brings great joy. It's like sometimes the hardest thing in the world. I know I should do this. I know this is God's will. I know I should do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Finally, you do it. 
And then there's like this peace because you did what was right. And that's what God says here. He wants us to abide in his love. And he says, I've spoken these things to you. Why? So that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. I don't know about you, but I want my joy to be made full even in the worst of circumstances. And that's because of who God is, that I'm abiding in him. He is kind. He is good. His word says he will never leave me nor forsake me. God says he understands my grief and my despair. And even in the midst of all that, my joy can be made full because of who he is. John 16, verses 23 to 24. And in that day you ask me no question. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you shall ask the Father for anything, he will give it to you in my name. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full. Now the context of these verses to these chapters is Jesus talking to his disciples, preparing them because he's going to the cross. And he's telling them all kinds of things that he wants them to know and take a hold of because of what they're about to experience. John 16, he says, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. He knows what they're getting ready to witness. But he says, in me you can have peace. Same things Philippians 4 tells us. When Paul writes that, he's like telling us that even in the midst of our circumstances, he says, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request, request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will, be, will guard your heart, the seat of emotion, and your mind in Christ Jesus. It's a peace that you can't even understand. And this is what he's telling his disciples to. It's in me you'll have peace. That's what Paul's saying in Philippians. It's in the Lord you can have peace, not a change of your circumstances. And then he tells his disciples and, and us, in the world you will have tribulation. Hey, bad times are going to happen to you. I mean, sin brought death. Sin brought all kinds of stuff. You're going to have problems. But take courage. I have overcome the world. Again, this is why we need to know our Bibles. This is why we need to know what's going to happen in the future, the Christ's return. We need to understand these things because even in the midst of all the tribulation and our free fall that we're in, God tells us to take courage because he has overcome the world. Then I love these verses, these passages in Scripture, because God gives us, tells us a little bit about the role of the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, this is before the church age. This is before Pentecost when he's telling his disciples this. And so they haven't, like now when we get saved, God the Holy Spirit comes, he indwells us. He lives in us. He Jesus is telling the disciples about the role of the Holy Spirit who is to come. And one of the things he says is the Holy Spirit is our helper in John 14, verses 16 to 24. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. I mean, they're just beginning to understand this. I will give you another helper that he may be with you forever because Jesus, Jesus is going to ascend into heaven after the crucifixion after he's, his resurrection. And he's going to send in heaven. He says, but the helper, he's going to be with you for he, forever. And he came on Pentecost. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you. And then he says, and he will be in you. He will be in you. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live in you. And then Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. Don't you just love that? He's letting them know now, you're not an orphan. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will behold me no more, but you will behold me because I live, you shall live also. In that day, you shall know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Again, what a wonderful promise. He says, if you have my commandments and you keep him, keep them, that's proof positive that you love the Lord. You love him because that's the person he says, who loves God? You know, these believers, or they claim to be believers, and then they just live like they want. They don't obey God. They have no regard for his commandments or his ways. 
that just shows they don't love him and maybe they don't even know him because a true believer has the want to, to obey the Lord. They want to put aside that old nature, even though at times, sometimes they're tempted by it. They don't like it. It's, they remember it's dead. They don't want it. It says, ask who loves me. And then in verse 22, he says, Judas not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him. You say, we, you know, the Trinity, we will come to him and make our abode with him. I mean, we're going to live in you. God's gonna, God lives in you. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which, which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. I mean, he's affirming his deity here. He's saying, I and the Father are one. He says that. And he's the one who helps us obey. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He continues in verse 25. These things I've spoken to you while abiding with you, but the helper... Remember, you know, the, I, I love to think about this because, you know, in Genesis, we see that the very first description of a woman is that she is a helper. The Holy Spirit is our helper. Helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. That verse is packed with so much truth because he's telling them that the Holy Spirit will teach you. He's telling them he's going to come. And then what else? Because the whole canon of Scripture has not been written yet. And he says, he's going to bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And that's what happened. They wrote the, the rest of the Bible. They wrote it. But the application for us is so wonderful because we have the Holy Spirit. He's our teacher. We ask him for his help when we don't know what to do. And then the words that you've heard that you stored in your heart from God's word, that's the role of the Holy Spirit. He will bring it to your remembrance all that he said to you. What would your life be like if you didn't have a copy of the scriptures? Let's just say in our United States that all the Bibles were banned and burned. How much of God's word do you know? How much would God be free to bring it to your mind? How much? Sometimes I beat myself thinking at my age I should have the whole Bible memorized if I just worked harder. But I'm just saying, I think about that sometimes. I want to know his word. John 16, verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Y'all, that's his job. You know, sometimes as you're reading the word of God, you don't understand, Lord, you're my teacher, you're my helper. Would you help me understand this? Point me to someone who has studied the ancient writings, who knows Hebrew, who knows Greek, and I want to learn your word. Whatever he hears, but whatever he hears is the Holy Spirit, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. And then the next thing is the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts of sin. John 16, verses 7 to 15. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Because, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. I mean, even that, that, that whole thing in the day we live when no one wants to talk about conviction of sin, we want to be told everything is okay, everything that we think, say, or do is all right. You just do you. You do you. I mean, you do you is okay in things that don't matter. You know, if you want to wear your hair a certain way or whatever, but not if it's, your, if it's about your life lining up with scripture. Not if it's like you do you. If you are trans, that's okay. You just do you. No, no, you don't do you. You don't do that. God convicts of sin. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. So people go to churches where the word of God is taught. I'm uncomfortable. This shepherd, this pastor is making me, I don't like what he's saying. Well, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit's working in your life? No, they don't want to hear it. I'm just going to go somewhere where I'll feel good. 
when no one says anything that's difficult to hear. Because you know what? I'm such a baby. I can't hear the truth. I'm like a baby, and I just want to be told everything's okay. But everything's not okay. A lot of the false teachers today say, peace, peace, but there is no peace. And we know there's no peace. It's only God who gives us peace. And then the Holy Spirit is the one in whom we walk. Galatians 5, 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. I mean, even that is so great. Because what's the desire of the flesh? I mean, there's so many desires of the flesh. The desire of the flesh is to lash out at my husband, to tell him a thing or two. Lash out at my kids and tell them a thing or two. The desire of the flesh on the road is like, what's that idiot doing? Why they pull out in front of me? You know, that's the desire of the flesh. And God says, if walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And then Ephesians 5 says, therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time. Why? Because the days are evil. I think about that so much that I want to make the most of my time. As I said, at some point in this, I don't want to be, as I go into my later years of life, be in this thing where I'm just wasting my time. The letter I sent out at the beginning of the year to all our women who are doing the the Bible reading challenge, I said, I want to run harder. I want to do more for the kingdom of God as much as I can. And and so he says, the days are evil. And then that's when he goes on and says, I don't want you to be drunk with wine. Don't fill your, you know, don't fill your body with things that are going to alter your state of mind. I want your mind sharp. I mean, that's even why in in Proverbs 31, when King Lemuel's mother is telling him, don't, strong drink is not for rulers. Don't do that. You're supposed to protect people. You're supposed to have a clear head. Don't do that. And if we belong to Christ... That's what we are. We're believer priests. It's not for us to do that. The Holy Spirit is the one who needs to control us. It's so important for us as women and as mothers. And understand that there's no one to blame for your actions or reactions as a mother but yourself. I mean, you say, well, you don't understand my situation. I don't, but God does. You know, my situation is different. It might be. But everybody's situation is different. Or you don't know my husband and kids. I don't, but God does. It's no excuse. I mean, what comes out of the well is what's in there. You know, when you put that bucket down in in the well, if there's water there, that water's going to come up. Whatever's down in the well is going to come up. So you have to think about that. Like whatever came out of you when your husband made you mad is what's in your well. Just think about that. James 1.14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And then, of course, Genesis 3, the reminder after the man and the woman's sin, the man who's blaming the woman, the woman you gave me, she's the one who gave me from the tree and I ate. I mean, she, it's her fault. And then, of course, the woman said, when God asked her, well, what have you done? And she said, it was a serpent. He deceived me. It's his fault. No, they were enticed and carried away by their own lust. God wants to be your source of joy. And then understand the flesh. I already talked about this again, but just by way of reminder, our flesh sometimes wants to scream bloody murder at our kids, snap at our husbands. And we're just like, yeah, I just want to get it out there. If you want to get it out there, talk to the Lord. Make it a prayer, a I mean, a reverent prayer to him. Lord, you know I feel this way. You know I want to scream bloody murder at my kids. You know I want to just give it right back to my husband. You know, in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, you know, don't return evil for evil, but give a blessing instead. You know, but what's our natural tendency? All of us, myself included, somebody insults me, I'm just going to insult them right back. Well, you did this. I mean, Carl and I have this joke all the time about if, you know, oh, well, we, I have my list too. <laughs> you have a list, and, and I, being so wicked that I am, I say, I know you have a list, of, and I know I'm very sinful, and you probably have about 20 things on it, but I have a list of 1,000. <laughs> and we just, we laugh about it. Okay, now let's talk to the, about the purposes of discipline. Uh, what is it anyway? I mean, it, discipline is just training. We often think about well, how do you discipline your child, and we're always just thinking, well, how do you punish them? We're not talking about punishment here. 
It's just training, and we want to expect it to produce a specific character. I mean, this is just a, 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 a definition from the dictionary. Expected to produce a specific character or pattern of behavior, especially training that produces moral and or mental improvement. And it takes discipline to do this with your children. I lo- I'm going to give you some passages that you can jot down, and you can later read them in their context. But Romans 12, 11 says, Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 26 to 27. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I buffet my body and make it my slave. It doesn't say I buffet my body. Okay. (laughs) I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I've preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. I mean, this is discipline. He's saying I run in such a way. I'm not just beating. I have purpose. I'm running this race, but I have purpose. And the reason I want to do this is because I don't want to be disqualified from this race that God has me on. Philippians 4, when Paul says, I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of both having an abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's a disciplined life that can accept what life gives to him, you know, because I've been times where I've been hungry. I've been times where I've had plenty. I've been times where the trials have been great and awful and long. It just seems like they're taking forever. And then I've been times where it's very joyful and peaceful for a while. Talk about circumstances here. But he said, you know what? I can go all through all of those things because Christ is the one who strengthens me and gives me strength. Hebrews 6, 12, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And of course, another de- uh, definition of training is to make proficient with specialized instruction and practice. I mean, just think about that. I know it's just a a, a dictionary definition, but practice, instruction, follow through. I mean, you know, you think about when you're training your child for a new chore, uh, maybe a new chore that you're giving them, and you tell them, you know, let's say you got a dog, and you've never had a dog, but the dog has to be fed every day, and you decide you're going to give a child who's old enough to take on that responsibility, you're going to be in charge of feeding the dog, and they need to be fed in the morning and evening or whatever thing you do. And you, maybe you even write out a little chart for the child to help them with this new thing. And then they do it the first day and the second day they forget. And you have to remind them. Well, many times that's not an act of disobedience. What that is, is, is you're trying to get a new habit going. And it takes time to, for something to be a new habit. You know, we use that term, a learning curve. You know, you got to learn something, like I, with my computers, with my phones, all this. Oh, it's like you get the new phone, and now, oh, now I'm swiping instead of pushing a button. Well, I'm not being disobedient if I try to push the button, because I've always done that. It's like, so you have to remember that sometimes with your children as you're walking in wisdom and giving them grace, is that wasn't so much disobedience. Is there, it's like a learning curve. And I, that's part of my job as a parent to help them learn that, that they're, I'm training them for a new responsibility in their life. It's kind of like when people have a new job. The, the boss doesn't expect them to be perfect right away. They sometimes have someone who comes in and trains them for that job to help them know what to do. I think of the summer that, that I waitressed when I was at Myrtle Beach for, you know, it was like the first day was very slow and I had training going on to remember, you know, how you do it and all this stuff. And then I remember it was like Memorial Day, which I was totally unprepared for all these people that came into the restaurant. It was like a madhouse. I spilled things. I forgot to bring drinks. I did all kinds of things. I wasn't being disobedient. I was trying to do my job, failed miserably at it. And it was terrible. But the boss, the owner of the restaurant, he didn't yell at me. He just said, well, we, you know, it's a crowd, you'll, you'll get it. But I remember going back to the place where I was staying and just crying, thinking, I can't go back. Such a baby. There's no way I can do this because I thought it was going to be that crowded every single day. But the next day it was slow. I got into sync. And then when we did have crowds, I could do it. No problem. That's part of what it is. That's about training. That's discipline. Now, in Hebrews um, chapter 12, the scripture says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. 
For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. I mean, think about that. If you belong to the Lord, we're all women here, so we're his daughters. And God deals with us as a daughter. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? I mean, that's a sign of love when you care about how your children turn out. I know you've heard Carl say many times, we don't discipline the neighbor's kids because they're not ours. We discipline our children because they belong to us. And God disciplines his children because we belong to him. And then he said, and then he makes that comparison about, you know, his relationship to us with the earthly fathers. He said, furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we much, shall, excuse me, shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they, talking about the earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, discipline, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. And all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. Remember, I hate you when you spank me. It's not fun to be disciplined. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Let those verses sink in and think about what God is saying here. What he's showing us that the purpose of discipline in our children's life is for their good because that's his purpose in disciplining his children. That's what he says. That's what he says right here in the scripture. He disciplines us for our good. It's for our good. Now think about that. It's not to satisfy your wrath because you've had it up to here. It's not because you just can't take it anymore. It's not because you're just an impatient person. It's not out of your selfishness. It's not out of your desire to have your own way. And when we discipline from the desire of the flesh, that's when we make all kinds of mistakes. That's why some of you, when you were growing up, had terrible experiences with your parents when they thought they were disciplining you, but they were actually overboard. That's why, because they were doing it out of the desire of the flesh. They just got angry, and they didn't know how to control their anger, and so they took it out on you. And that, you know, and some of, some of you I know are scarred by situations like that. But that's why you learn God's word. That's why you know what he says. And that's why you make, you know, as I said earlier, some of you might be first generation Christians and you be different. And you realize the desire of the flesh. And you realize that, the, no, the purpose of discipline is for my child's good. Am I thinking about this is for their good? And then the second thing is the purpose of discipline is to train our children in holiness. That's God's purpose in discipline for us. He says it right here in his word. It says, but he disciplines us for our good. Why? That we may share in his holiness. It's to make us holy. God disciplines us to get us back on the path to, so that we'll see what's go, how we're going wrong. And then the third thing we see from this passage is that the purpose of discipline is so that our children's lives will be righteous because that's what he says. It's right here in his word. We may share his holiness, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, there's that word again, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I mean, think about that. Isn't that what you want? I mean, think about when you, as a parent, have disciplined your children biblically, and you know in this situation, you did it right. Your child responds differently because they know their sin deserve this. They want someone innately to keep them in check. They really don't want to get away with their sin. And then it's like everything's calm again. It's like they knew they even needed it. They wouldn't necessarily say that beforehand. And they're always gambling that you're not going to do, you're not going to do anything about their sin because they'll push you, push you, push you, push you. And it's a problem with us to let them do that. Proverbs, oh wait, let me finish. The writer to the Hebrews goes on. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak. Your children's hands are weak. They're little. The knees that are feeble, they're little people. 
Make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame, the one that kind of got out of joint, may not, and he says, we don't want to put it out of joint. You know, if you got a broken leg, you don't make that worse. No, you want to heal it. That's what he says, but rather be healed. So whatever's going on that you have to deal with with your children's sin nature, you got to remember, I got to help them because if they continue on this path, they're going to be put out of joint. It's going to be awful for them and for everybody they come in contact with. No, I got to help them. I don't want to make things worse. I want it to be healing for them. And then the writer to the Hebrews says, pursue peace and and sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, and there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. I mean, you think about how many children have had so much bitterness as they've grown up because parents have been out of control and being harsh with them. And if that's your case and you have bitterness in your heart about that, you got to go to the Lord about that. And you have to let him release you of that because you don't want a root of bitterness to be in your life. Why? Because it's going to cause trouble your whole life. And sometimes it's not so much necessarily that you're doing it for that person who hurt you. You're doing it so God can use you. You're doing it for your own healing. You, and we have to do that, y'all. We can't go through our lives focused on people who've hurt us. Let God deal with them. Let's respond biblically to that. And let's be the kind of parent our children need as we discipline and train them. Proverbs 23, 24, and 25 says, The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and your mother be glad and let her rejoice who gave birth to you. I mean, he's just saying the father of the righteous. And he wants us as parents to take this seriously so our children will grow up to be wise. And then they bring us much joy. They bring us gladness. And then a mom has, you know, she rejoices uh, over her children. Now, we'll move quickly through the practical everyday stuff. Establish your authority from the cradle. You know, you begin to help train your children. You're in charge your, even your little baby needs to learn to rest in your authority. You establish a routine. I always just called mine a flexible routine. I didn't go by somebody's rigid standard. But I know that just like we know in life, God's a God of order. There's an ebb and flow to life. Tides come in, tides go out, sun rises, sun sets. You know, there's hours, weeks, days, mo- I mean, there's hours, days, weeks, months, year, cyclical. That's the way God's ordered our world. He's a God of order. He hung the stars in space. He's, he made the galaxies. He's a God of order. So our homes need to be orderly. You know, we want to help our children with that. But it can look different from somebody else's home. But there needs to be a sense of order to it. And you got to keep in mind that your home is a, a changing dynamic. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not static. It's always changing. Some of the things you struggle with as a new mom or you struggle with certain disobedience there, it's not going to stay that way forever. You know, you're not, it's not going to always be this way. And you had to remember, remember that open window. Even in terms of your home, things are going to change And you have to grow with that. And when your baby's little, you you help them learn delayed gratification as they get older. I'm not talking about in those early months when it's demand feeding and and the response is great and the bonding. I'm not talking about that time. I'm talking about as they get a little older. And then you you start letting them fuss. He's going to be okay. You know, you don't have to always soothe the baby when, and I'm talking, again, I'm talking about when they're older. I'm not talking about newborns and really young babies. And you don't need, if the baby's crying or the toddler's crying, that doesn't have to rob your joy. No one needs to be upset except the baby. Just remember that the baby's crying. That doesn't mean I got to cry. You know, they're throwing a temper tantrum. That that doesn't mean I'm going to throw a temper tantrum. No, you're the one in charge. You, it's not, and, and again, think about it, it's not so much what the baby and the toddler does, it's what you do about it, because they're doing the natural thing, because they're natural sinners. You have to help them with that. That's your job, 
toddlers and preschoolers. Again, you maintain your authority. You provide lots of practice and obedience, training your toddler to pick up his blocks, obedience, cleaning his room. You don't give them commands that they can't do. I remember one time when Grant was four years old and I told him to go clean his room. I mean, how stupid is that? I hadn't taught him really how to clean his room. He knew generally what that meant. So he goes up there and he's like up there working on it and he cleans it. And he came and he told me, he said, I'm finished, it's clean. I go up there and I look at it and I think, this ain't clean. I mean, he had like this monkey thing strung from a doorknob over to, to the bed. He had all kinds of stuff. And I just looked at the room and I said, well, this is clean. He said, yeah. And then he kind of walked me around. I said, okay, to, for his four-year-old mind and a mom who didn't train him what that means, this is pretty good. <laughs> But you got to train them to do it. And then if there's willful disobedience and attitude or action, like open defiance, yes, there should be some physical consequences. But it's got to be biblical, biblical physical consequences. <laughs> you know, like whining. You want to train them not to whine? You just don't give them. You know, if they're whining for something, if you give it to them, what does that tell them? Whining, I get what I want when I whine. You say, no, you, you, I'm, not get, I'm not giving you anything as long as you're whining. And then you, you whine. You say, imagine if I went around and went, I need my like breakfast, oh, you know. And then they laugh. But you teach them those things. This is how you say it. We're not going to be a bunch of whiners in this home. Brogies aren't whiners. We're not whining. You know, and you got to be consistent about those things. You got to practice, practice, practice. And these are the years that require lots of energy and discipline on your part. Don't view them as burdens. God's training you as you're training your children. You know, train up a child in the way that he should go, the way of righteousness. Train, train them. It does, it's not just going to happen. I just wish these kids would be nice. No, they're not going to be nice on their own. You have to help them with that. Help them with those things. Let's see. I, I want to make some closing thoughts here. Control them when they're young. As they grow older, teach them as you go about life. You do this as adolescents and as teenagers. You do all these things. You continue to maintain your authority. And you teach them the basics of the Christian life. If you're a new Christian, just teach them what you know. You don't know everything. And you tell them, I don't know everything. I'm learning. You know, let's say you can't, became a Christian in your 40s and you already got like, some teenagers. You tell you, I just, I became a Christian. This is what I understand. You share the gospel with them. I'm learning. I'm learning some things. I've done some things wrong. You tell them. You share the gospel with them. But you teach them what you know. You live out a dependent life to the Lord before them. And like I said, to, reminded you before, just like the Israelites in the Old Testament, God will supply daily manna for you. You know, and Jesus, even in his prayer, he, 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 he teaches us to pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. It's every day I need it. And then as you, you teach them as you go how to deal with their sinful emotions, you watch for things in your children's lives as they're going through puberty, as they're dealing with the emotional ups and downs that, you know, girls have those and boys have that when they're facing puberty. You see like the changes, sometimes their moodiness isn't because they're being like all sinful. It's just so many changes are happening to them. As a parent, you're training yourself to help them through those. Sometimes that mood, that those times in their lives, they don't even understand it. But you help them understand it. And you help them understand that even those times when it's legitimate that I'm dealing with some things going on in my life, that's not an excuse to sin through it. I need to start to trust God with even my emotions. This is, and sometimes you say, this is how I learned to deal with that in my own life. And it was hard for me. Help them with those things. I mean, you don't want to teach your children to be play actors, pretend you know, you let them know that it's natural to be angry about things, to be sometimes to feel resentful, to get bitter. But this is how we need to handle those things. Those are natural tendencies of our sin nature. It's no excuse, but we have to learn, yeah, you're going to be really angry about something. Let's talk about righteous anger and unrighteous anger. Let's talk about what we do with that anger. And then always remember to discipline from a heart of love. Because love covers a multitude of sins. You know, the Bible repeats that three times that I'm aware of in Scripture when he says that. You know, it covers, it's, it's, it protects. 
You know, you protect other, even other Christians, sometimes you protect their sins. You know how we hear some juicy gossip or something really bad about somebody, and then we want to tell it? No, love covers that, that you want to help those people through that. Biblical love never fails, and I want to remind you, you will do all kinds of things wrong. You will. You just remember that God is faithful, even when you're disappointed, disappointed with yourself. You just remember that you need him. Don't get prideful in your mothering, in your wifing, in your homemaking, in your whatever it is. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Don't get prideful in your methods, your way of doing things. You know, only boast in the Lord and his word and what his word says. Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welf your welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Father, I thank you for this session on discipline. I pray that the things we've learned about the purpose of discipline and even the little bit of practical application that we've talked through, I pray that you would use this in the lives of these women. I pray that they would remember that you are the, their helper, that God the Holy Spirit, if they know you, lives inside of them, and he helps them, and he will guide them into all truth, and he will provide the daily manna. I just thank you for who you are, Lord. And as we go to lunch, bless this food, bless all the women who have prepared it and made it ready for us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed this episode of Rare But Real, be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified when a new episode is posted. And share this podcast with friends. Follow Audrey on Instagram and Facebook at Mothering From The Heart. And listen to all her messages on the Search the Scriptures app.